Episode 55. Larry Murphy is my favorite athlete to wear the number 55. My dad was born in the year 1955, and on December 1st, 1955, the inspirational Rosa Parks refused to give up her bus seat for a Caucasian male, thereby igniting the civil rights movement. Beyond MD, episode 55, here we go! Hey everyone, thank you again for joining me on Beyond MD. So recently, I started an allowance system for both of my kids. So if they help out around the house and they do a good job, then they will get paid their age in dollars every week. My boys are nine and six. And I've told them that there's four things that you can do with your money. You can save it, you can invest it, you can spend some of it, but don't forget to give. So this brings me to the topic of today, which is philanthropy. So we'll be talking about a few key topics, most notably donor-advised funds and private foundations. To help me with this, I have Mark Halpern, who is a certified financial planner, trust and estate practitioner, and master financial advisor in philanthropy. Mark is the CEO of WealthInsurance.com, and he has been assisting professionals and many of Canada's most affluent families for decades with an expertise in insurance solutions and tax strategic philanthropy to enhance wealth and build generational legacies. Mark also sits on advisory councils and task forces for many hospital foundations, including SickKids, St. Joseph's Hospital, St. Michael's Hospital, and Humber River Hospital. Mark is one of the go-to individuals in Canada when it comes to educating others in philanthropy, and he, in fact, contributed curriculum material for the groundbreaking Master Financial Advisor Philanthropy designation. So we talk about a fair bit today, but the most important topic will be that of the Donor Advised Fund. This is a fund that you or others can contribute to. The contributions generate a tax deduction. The money in the fund will grow tax-free. And then you can decide over time which charities are going to benefit from this money. This is a very basic overview. Obviously, there's a bit more to it. And we're going to dive into the fund details now. So please enjoy my conversation with Mark Halpern. And this is round two with Mark on Beyond MD. Mark, I want to welcome you back to the podcast. I I thoroughly enjoyed our last conversation and it's been so long. You're a really busy guy. You're you're doing a lot of good things. And before we get into today's topic, Mark, I did want to ask you like your efforts on educating others about philanthropy, tax minimization, like how is that uptake going? What is the response from the community? Well, it's, it's, it's slow. It's slow in the sense of, you know, you're one person, there's 86,000 charities and there are millions of people in, uh, in Canada and, and who have not incorporated strategic philanthropy into their estate plans. So, but it's very rewarding because I've been doing a lot of work. I just did a, um, a webinar with KPMG for mm-hmm. their family office partners across the country, mm-hmm. uh, for Moody's tax services out West, um, uh, for, for, for legal practices. So now you're meeting those gatekeepers who now get it. And and for most of them, you know, they do tremendous tax planning up till this level, but there's an entire shelf above dealing with philanthropy that they just are not knowledgeable on or don't understand. So it's very rewarding to talk about collaborating and sort of that clients today need a team of experts. You can't be all things to one people because each person brings their unique 30,000 foot perspective. So that's exciting. Since we were together, Yatin, we've, we've really crystallized our mission, our corporate mission, Mm -hmm. which is, is made up of three things, which is pertains to what we're talking about. Number one is we want to, we're on a bit of a, a, you know, a crusade to ensure that every professional and charity is incorporating strategic philanthropy into clients' estate planning. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that tax part for in, in a moment. That's number one. The second thing is we really want to be in a country where everybody knows what insurance is, but very few people really understand what it does. Mm -hmm especially the high net worth, they look at it as a grudge purchase from when they bought it, when they had a mortgage or young kids, or they, you know, they bought something from an advisor they never heard from again, you know, like there's a, so, so, so we want them to understand what it does. And once they understand what it does, it's incredible how it, how it complements their planning. And the third thing we're trying to do, Eugene, is we're trying to create a national community of 100 allied professionals and charities that if we're all committed to creating $10 million of legacy, money that if you have a hundred times 10 million that's a billion dollars a year and that's not something that's sort of pie in the sky that's kind of like crowdfunding and it's it's easy to do once you 
incorporate this into conversations with people who really do want to go from what we call success to significance. Or if they have a choice where their taxes go, they're like, hey, I'd like to give it to charity. 100%. Hundred percent, and Mark, I feel like with time, you've just you're basically in my mind the go-to person when it comes to philanthropy and incorporating that into your overall plan, and that's why I'm really excited to have you back on. So today we're going to have three topics to talk about: donor advised funds, private foundations, and then charitable uh, gift annuities. So I, I, let's get into donor advised funds first because I think that that is the most relevant topic to my listeners. So maybe can you give us a quick overview of what that is, and then I can go into the details. Perfect. So, so first of all, um, there are people are familiar with private foundations, right? A private foundation is something that you would set up with a lawyer, and there's a setup fee, and there's annual reporting, and and now you have an independent fund that has to be managed. The assets have to be managed, and you can give that money away to any registered charity in Canada at any time. And there's a minimum that has to go out now. They just, the government changed it's 5% mm. has to go out every year. It used to be three and a half percent. Now it's 5% as of, of January. Now that's really for wealthy people. That's for people who have at least $2 million, let's say of, of charity that they've allocated. And they also like to have control over investing that money. And, and it's something that's likely going to continue for many years. So you see some of the big families, they have big family foundations, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's not available to everyone. So what is available is there's a, a, a sort of hybrid, which is something called a donor advised fund, also known as a DAF. You'll hear it as an acronym. And what it is, is you borrow or piggyback on a community foundation's umbrella, and you can now put your named foundation underneath their umbrella. They take care of the governance and compliance, and often they take care of the investment as well of those assets. So they have, uh, you know, an investment committee, and, you know, they're very particular about where that money it has to be maintained. And, and, and then you can distribute money out of your donor advice fund, as I said, to any registered charity in Canada. It's very easy to set up. The, the costs to at least participate are very minimal depending on which donor advised fund. And there are some donor advised funds where you can actually still manage your own assets, wow. which means mm -hmm. you've got charity money going into it. And instead of your investment advisor saying, hey, you just took all these assets out of management, those advisors can still manage that money and still get that AUM, those assets under management for them. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. So that's that's what a donor advised fund is. And there and and uh, you know you have companies out there called like the Community Foundation, like the Toronto Foundation, the mm -hmm. Oakville, the Mississauga Foundation. You also have Abundance or Bene, Bene, Benefaction or uh, the banks all have donor advised funds. Okay. Scotia Bank has Aqueduct. You've got so, uh, but I personally feel that they're the best kept secret in Canada. And that's why it's really exciting to be on the show to help people understand. Okay. So maybe the way we can break it down is Mark, like, let's talk about how money goes into a fund. Then we'll talk about the fund and then we'll talk about the outflow after. I just thought, you know, medical professionals, that's how I think. Uh, so, so let's talk about what can go into a donor advised fund. Like, is it, is it cash stock? Can you put real assets like real estate? I'm just curious if there are any restrictions. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So the first thing is still today, um, most Canadians call it like 96% of Canadians are still giving cash checks or credit cards to charities, right? Which really is the most cost and tax inefficient way of giving because it works out to about 50 cents on the dollar that you're giving, okay? Mm -hmm. So for every dollar you're giving, it's costing you 50 cents. There are significantly more efficient ways of giving that will actually save your listeners a lot more money. Number one is the donation of appreciated securities. Mm -hmm. Non-registered uh, mutual funds, uh, ETFs, segregated funds, uh, mutual fund stock, anything that's appreciated, you have to appreciate that those funds, if you sell them on the market and they've appreciated, the gain, let's just say it cost you $10,000 and now it's grown to $50,000. 
when you sell that, there's a $40,000 capital gain, in which case there'd be a $10,800 tax, which means the $50,000 you'd be donating, let's say, uh, or, or selling your stock at, really you're only getting back less than 40000 But the government went ahead and was very gracious to say that Canadians can donate appreciated securities to charity directly or to their donor advised fund pay no capital gains taxes so that 27% of the gain that doesn't belong to you now is part of your charitable fund and you get a market you get a fair market value uh, receipt for the funds that you donated in kind at that time so you save a whole bunch of money on tax you haven't paid any capital gains so you can actually create even more for your charity and for donor advised funds so i'm just saying if there's a one takeaway today don't donate cash. Stop giving. Yeah. Char- stop giving. So that's number one. That's one thing you could put in. Another thing that you can put into a donor advised fund would be something like a life insurance policy. It could be that you have an an existing life insurance policy, maybe that you got when you know the kids were young and it was a, a small policy for hundred thousand, mm-hmm. two fifty five. That maybe you don't need anymore and it wouldn't move the dial on your estate planning. You could actually take that policy and get a fair market value on that and now donate it to your donor advised fund, in which case you get a charitable receipt that would save you a lot of money of taxes now. And going forward, any premiums you pay to the donor advised fund would also get you a charitable receipt. So now you've created a, a significant legacy gift, right? And yep. hopefully we'll get a chance. There's a new product that, manual, or that Canada Life launched called My Par Gift that's specifically for charities. I hope that we'll get a chance to talk about that. It just launched at the end of March and I was involved with the design of that over the last two years. So I think you'll, you'll, your listeners will be very interested in that. Oh, that that is interesting. I mean, that could be something to talk about in the future for sure. So I, I, I like that you mentioned that. So I'm happy to report to you also, Mark, that I just use this strategy of gifting appreciated shares for the first time. I, I thought it was a great time now to do something good, to do something meaningful. And I, what I ended up doing was I ended up transferring appreciated shares from my corporation. So it's the first time I've done that. And I think it is a tax efficient way. Now, you last time also talked about the triple benefit of transferring appreciated shares from your corporation. Like these are the ones with the biggest gains to charity. Now, can you also, I guess, transfer that into your own donor advised fund to make it really, really tax efficient. Is that allowed? Beautiful, beautiful. By the way, the last thing I wanted to say about you asked, what can you put into a donor advised fund? There's one other asset that I want to talk about, which was flow through shares. Okay. Flow through shares are, 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 structure they've been around for a long time they're generally mining uh research uh development uh all that stuff and they allow you to create a gift for the least cost possible which you can then put into your donor advised fund so if cash costs you 50 cents on the Mm -hmm. dollar a a a flow through might cost you anywhere between 5 to 15 cents on the dollar depending on what's available and what province you live in so that's also very efficient, and that can also be moved into a donor advised fund. Those are the three biggies that I just want to say. Real estate, you can't do it. Yeah, you can't do it with real yeah. estate. Okay, okay, fair enough. Now, from from the the corporation though, can you transfer appreciated shares from your corporation into your own donor advised fund? That may be a bit of a technical question, but uh, for a lot of us who are incorporated, I'm curious if that's a valid strategy. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, it it works the exact same way as yeah. donating personal appreciated securities. But let's just say these securities are inside your yeah. your Investco, your Holdco, whatever the case might be. Now, so you'll you'll get in this case, you'll get a deduction, a yeah. corporate deduction mm-hmm. for the donation that you're making, which reduces the taxable value on your corporation, which mm-hmm. can be very good. Mm-hmm. That that's great. There's no capital gains taxes. Right. So again. Saving that twenty seven percent, you know, on capital gains taxes. And and you get a fair market so you've got that deduction. The the bonus here, yeah, Tim, which is very good, is that the gain on that those those shares that you donated in kind. Let's remember remember the one that we said fifty thousand dollars of fair market value, ten thousand dollars of cost. So there's a forty thousand dollar gain there. 
The bonus of doing it corporately is that $40,000 capital gain gets credited to the corporation's CDA, the capital dividend account, which That's is right. a marginal. Yeah. Now, that money now can come out of the corporation tax free. So you're getting $40,000 out, where if you took $40,000 out, you'd be taxed at, let's say, 50% on that. So it's almost like doing toasty, like tax on, you know, on, on spousal, the getting it back. You, you can create money out to your family on a tax-free basis. And then if if you want to do something really substantial mm -hmm. using corporate, you know, why not set up a donor advice fund if you're not sure where you want to give the money away to mm -hmm. right away. And then you can actually use insurance to replace the donation that you made so that your family gets to be made whole. It's just a timing issue. So those are really neat things to look at, especially if any of your professionals are experiencing a liquidity event where they're selling a, selling a practice or they're selling some you know, investment real estate. That's a great time to be looking at philanthropy to mitigate that. Interesting. So basically, the basic concept is whatever goes into the donor advice fund, you get a, a charitable receipt, right? So you're, you're reducing your tax. Now, that that charitable receipt or that deduction on tax does that have to be claimed in that year or how far forward can that be carried yeah it's it, it's a great question let's let's we'll talk about donations made during your lifetime and donations made at death these would also include yep. you know your donor advice yep. fund so in any given year donations can be ch to charity can be used to mitigate up to 75% of mm -hmm. your net taxable income mm -hmm. That means if somebody, let's just say, owes $100,000 of tax mm -hmm. and they give $200,000 to charity, they'll get a receipt for $200,000, which will save them $100,000 of tax, but you can only use them for $75,000. So you could use that for $75,000 of the $100,000 tax. Mm -hmm. The government will allow you to carry forward up to five years any unused five years. Okay. charitable. So that's five years. Okay. Now, the part that most people don't know, though, is in the year of death – Charitable receipts can be used to mitigate 100% of estate taxes, terminal taxes, and they can be used for the year prior as well. So it's a very great way, and we've talked about this before, about incorporating philanthropy into your, your estate planning because really for every dollar you give to charity – when you die, or for every two dollars you give to charity as part of your estate plan, you save a dollar of tax. Mm -hmm. so you're really taking that dollar of tax and creating charity with it. That's why it's so important to have this conversation. Now, let's say if I was to set up a donor advice fund, and if I had other people in my life who wanted to help me to be charitable, are they also allowed to contribute to my donor advice fund, or do I have to set something up where I have multiple people on that fund? How does that work? It's like any charity. Yeah. Anyone can donate money to it. Okay. They get the tax benefit, yep. so they get the charitable receipt, and you just get now the fame of being able to distribute that money to charities you care about. That's why it can be extremely nice for a family, let's say, when they have some sort of life cycle mm -hmm. event. There's a christening, there's a marriage, there's a bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. there's a sweet 16. Instead of getting gifts, why not go ahead and have people make contributions to your family love foundation. That. Yeah. They get a charitable receipt. Yeah. Now you're you're passing along values and virtues and things that are, are really important, especially if people are building and, and the other thing, Yatin, you have to know that that you don't have to be Bill Gates and Warren Buffett to do this. This mm -hmm. is this is civilian stuff we're talking about. Like you can actually have a foundation and it's a lovely feeling because those foundations can now distribute money often in just uh, uh, amounts of as of a hundred dollars or more and they take care of all the administration for you so they send it out to 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 wherever it is that you want and they'll send it out either from your foundation so there's a recognition to you or mm -hmm. they can do it anonymously as well some people like that now you mentioned we don't have to be super super wealthy to set up a donor advised fund but just so listeners know what they would be getting into is there a minimum amount that one would be expected to contribute each year to keep it going so so in terms of amounts to give every year, there's no minimum amounts at all. The only minimum amount is when you start the donor advice fund. Like how much money do you have to put in? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, it can be anywhere from for the major the bigger organizations, it could be somewhere between ten and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But let's just say somebody puts in ten thousand, they get a charitable receipt, so it's really only costing them five, but now they've got ten thousand dollars in their donor advice fund. That's that would be one example. But then there are other 
uh, donor advised funds like mycharityfund.ca, mycharityfund.ca, where you can actually create a donor advised fund with no minimum. Okay. And when you distribute money, there's no minimum or size mm-hmm. to distribute. So I have one of those as well for my business and personally, where if I just want to give $10 here or $15 or $18 or whatever, I just go online and it's so beautifully navigated that, you know, it they they distribute the money. Generally, it's through uh, transfers from banks to banks, but it's a, it's a Canadian registered charity. Yep. And for that, there's no minimum. One of the organizations that I'm involved with, I'm a trustee at the Jewish Foundation of Greater Toronto. Mm-hmm. They've gone ahead and created a donor advice fund for children. Oh. That really, they're encouraging the grandparents to give to. So a child can have a donor advice fund for a minimum of $500, meaning grandpa, grandma, mm-hmm. give $500 to this donor advice fund that's now, I don't know, if you're, you're, one of your children's names. You think yeah, one of your yeah, kids' yeah. names. Yeah, Rohan. Rohan is my oldest. Rohan, yeah. Rohan yeah. will now have a donor advice yeah. fund that, that every year he can distribute that money and he can get engaged and involved in giving charity and developing that beautiful charitable muscle. Grandma... And grandpa, they get the charitable receipts, yeah. but now he's eventually going to continue building that up and putting in money and presents along the way. And hopefully it'll become multi-million dollars. Like he'll just develop such a beautiful charitable muscle that he's going to want to continue doing this in perpetuity, which is why they set this up. We'll be right back. If you're a doctor and you want to learn more about financial literacy, consider signing up for the Physician Financial Wellness Conference, which is being held on November 18th on a Saturday over Zoom, and this is organized by Dr. Stephanie Zhao. I'll be talking about what I wish I knew 10 years ago. There will be other amazing speakers at this conference, including Drs. Paul and Jane Healy, Dr. Mark Soth, the Looney Doctor, Larry Bates, and others. Topics discussed include pensions, corporations, investing, contracts, and job negotiations. The beauty about this conference is that the proceeds are philanthropic and going towards the Equity Award, which is an endowment fund for medical students in financial need. This is all amazing work by Dr. Stephanie Zhao in setting it all up and keeping this conference an annual tradition. The sign-up link will be in the show notes. And now, back to the interview. Mark, by the way, I love your notion here of setting one of these up and encouraging people to contribute to this fund when you have a big family event when you have a big celebration instead of focusing on like boxed goods and gifts uh, like honestly just they get, just a, they just get a shift. returned oh 100 100 right. like just a shift away from that i think is really important for people to think about and like you say i think that encourages values uh within the family and i think it's a beautiful thing so Let's say one wants to go ahead and set one up. It sounds like you just piggyback onto an existing foundation, but what is that process like? Is it easy to set up a donor advised fund? Yeah, very easy. It can all be done in 24 hours. Okay. So you, you would contact either a community foundation like the Toronto yep. Foundation, the Jewish Foundation, the Oakville Foundation. They've got wonderful, wonderful, wonderful staff to help you with that. Uh, there's some paperwork what name you want to give to your foundation. It could be that you're opening up a foundation for your late parents and you want it to be in their names or grandparents mm-hmm. or or something that you care about. You can come up with whatever the name is and then uh, it has all sort of the governance and compliance around that, how it works, the minimums you have to give out. And then you give them money. Either you give them a check or you transfer money to them mm-hmm. or you give them a credit card and you're good to go. Now, you mentioned that the foundations that you may piggyback onto and set up your your DAF, they may have a certain way that they go about investing. But I I guess some people also like to have a say in how they want the funds invested. Can you kind of speak about the balance there? Like what's possible if I set up a DAF, can I have some say or can my advisor, if I had one, have some say on how these funds are invested? Yeah, so with the community foundations, generally they have their own financial uh, committee, their finance committee. So this would be an investment committee that vets all of the investments Mm -hmm. that the foundation is investing to globally. But if you have a certain amount that you put in, generally it's a considerably higher amount. It could be a million or $2 million that you're, you're putting in. They'll allow you to incorporate your own investment manager with that money. So even though they're using, you're piggybacking their 
their their umbrella now you have your manager who's managing that money as long as it's it's it 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 follows their particulars which again you're not going to be able to put it all into cryptocurrency or something <laughs> that's going to blow your brains it has to be done very very responsibly so there's that there's also yeah. a wonderful um donor advised fund in Canada called Canada Gives mm-hmm. Canada Gives is used by a lot a lot of investment advisors who are encouraging their clients to be philanthropic, but where they still want the assets under management. So Canada Gives has this wonderful um, structure in place where you can open up your donor advice fund and have your investment advisor manage manage that money. And Mm -hmm. again, if you have a long-term relationship with that advisor, you know that they're good and reasonable and have had expected rates of return. So that gives people a lot of, you know, peace of mind knowing that it's being managed by people they know already and have a history with. So let's say the foundation is managing the investments. What kind of fees can people expect to be charged? Is it the, the the usual kind of one percent or is there a yeah 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 that's really what it it, it comes down to it's normally scaled yeah you know it can be anywhere from one to one percent to a certain threshold and then a gotcha. lesser gotcha. amount from a higher threshold but I think if you just look at it as one percent now it, it, with the community foundations it might be a little bit more it, but you have to appreciate that those are really set up for a community. Mm-hmm. They're, they're funding, let's say you go to the Caledon Community Foundation, you know, the Kawartha Lakes Community Foundation. They're using that money to fund infrastructure and social wel- welfare in all of the Kawarthas, right? So whatever you're giving, let's mm-hmm. say in terms of, a, 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 you know, a fee, it's going to manage sort of like, you know, the governance, the things that have to be done, mm-hmm. but they want to also create money that they can be using for some of that infrastructure in that area. Gotcha. So you, basically what it's saying is that your your charity is going, you know, is, is sort of continuing to, to, to be used in many, many different ways. So, but each one, you just have to find out what, what makes sense for you. Perfect. My understanding, Mark, is that whatever is in the donor advised fund is going to grow tax-free by or tax sheltered, but are there any cases where that may not apply? Like, let's say something skyrockets in value and you try to donate it to charity in a very short time frame. Like, does the tax free growth rule apply in all cases? Well, remember, when you donate that money to yeah. the charitable foundation, it no longer belongs to you. Mm. You have no more. It's it's cash. It's not invested. It's it's cash over there. So. It's growing tax free because it's a charity. Whatever is yeah. happening in that, there's yeah. no taxes are not subject to ta- uh, charities are not subject to taxation. So the money is just sitting there growing. You have no say in terms of if it's if it's if you're working with one of those donor advised funds where they have a finance committee. There's you have no input. If you're with your own investment advisor, so then you do have an input. But if it goes skyrocketing. The only thing great about that is you have more money to give away yeah. to charity, okay. right? Okay. But 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 they're not. And again, that would only be in a case where you know it's it's let's say um, uh, securities that are being invested by your investment advisor, as if it was your regular non-registered portfolio. Okay. Now let's talk about the outflow of money mm. from that fund into into charities. Just tell us about. Like how many, is there a limit on the number of charities we can pick or geographically are there limitations? Um, And then also in terms of the money flowing out of the fund to charities that we choose, is there a certain minimum percentage that must flow out each year to charity? So the neat thing about if a a private foundation versus a a, uh, a public foundation or a donor advised fund is with the private foundation, it has been now increased to 5% has to be distributed Mm -hmm. to charities every year, right? From 3.5%. So for each of these sort of community foundations or community donor advised funds, it varies, but it can be anywhere, you know, up to let's say 5% as well. But even though you are ethically and morally obligated to use that money for charity because until it gets into the hands of the charity it's not charity it's just sort of a it's sort of like a you know a bank account of your charity money to give because the 
overall donor advised fund is distributing so much money, it could actually be that you don't have to distribute any of your money because the charity itself has distributed the 5% and even more. So therefore, you individually do not have to give out. Again, there are people who let it ride and don't give out any of that money until they have to or they're encouraged to. But as I said, it's not charity until it's in the hands of the charity. And then, as I said, it can go to any charity in Canada. So there are 86,000 charities. Mm -hmm. You can give it to any registered charity in Canada, depending on your likes, your dislikes. You don't have to decide right now. You also, though, have to decide what happens to your donor advised fund if you go bye-bye, like if you're no longer right. around. What happens then? That's a very important planning decision. Uh, I know with us, we have a number of donor advised funds, but my wife Rhonda and I, we have five children. So once the kids sort of turn 18, we add them to the board of okay. our donor advised fund mm -hmm. such that if anything should happen to us, they'll now be responsible for continuing to do the good that we've done, plus their good as sort of the custodians or trustees for the next generation so we can create this money in perpetuity for good causes. Is it possible to give money from the donor advised funds to charities outside of Canada? So there is. There are ways to do it. Mm. There are organizations yeah. um, uh, where, let's say, you have an interest in community building in India, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there are organizations that are set up in such a way that you can move money to them and you can still – it's their Canadian charities – but they're involved in charitable, legitimate charitable work in other countries. Yeah. So that's a great question. And we do have people who are, are involved with that. So Mark, last question really on donor advised funds. Are there any cons to a donor advised fund? I mean, the, the only thing that I've heard in my reading is some people are occasionally critical of them in the sense that they say, well, this money's going into this fund, you're getting these tax receipts, and then people are leaving the money in the fund, it's not eventually, or it's taking a long time for it to make it out to charity in some cases. That's one thing I can think of. But then others say, well, donor advised funds are, are great because even during the tough times when the economy may not be doing as well, uh, we're in a recession, then we have money in these funds that is meant for charity. So we have constant flow of money to charity. So Maybe you can speak to this. I just want to know, are there any cons to this process in your mind? Yeah. So, so I think the only thing that I've seen is, you know, the, the returns vary depending on, you know, if, you, if you're part of a community foundation where mm -hmm. they're investing all of your money, remember their objective is just to um, break even, let's say, with distributions, mm -hmm. right? So if, if the distribution is 5%, they'd like to make 5% so that this fund stays working in perpetuity. But if you want, you can have a, a, a completely flow through where you just distribute the money in one fell swoop. You've got a hundred thousand in there. You can just give it away, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't, there's no, no rule that says you have to keep that donor advised fund going. The other thing is, is you can also move that money. If let's say you're not happy with that donor advised fund, or now you want to be in a donor advised fund where you're managing the money, mm -hmm. you can transfer that money without any penalty from one charity to another charity to now manage. So really the donor advised fund with a community foundation or one of those organizations that men mentioned you are really a great place to start. It might be one that people want to st stay at. Conversely, people who have f uh, private foundations where maybe they get tired of that annual reporting and the management, they can always transfer private foundation money into a donor advised fund too, which I think is is really great. The other thing, because you're asking about the, the goods and the bads, um, there, the biggest difference between a private foundation and a donor advised fund is that private foundations are public Right. And donor advised funds are private. Okay. That means if I right now went online and you give me a name of a famous Canadian family, mm -hmm. I could go to the CRA website and pop up their name and you'll see exactly what's in their foundation, who they give to, who's on the board, how much money did they make. It's completely public. Whereas a donor advised fund is completely private because it's it's under the umbrella of the community foundation. And people like that. They don't want to necessarily have people knowing what they're doing philanthropically. And sometimes they don't even want to know 
a recipient knows who the money is coming from. They want to do things very, very modestly. So, you know, I think it just provides a, a really good alternative. Okay, that was going to be my next question. Key differences between a donor advised fund and private foundations. You touched on private foundations are in fact public. You also mentioned earlier that people typically need hefty sums of money to really start a private foundation. So we're talking about a, at least a few million dollars, right? Uh, to make this Correct. practical? Couple, yeah, a couple yeah. million dollars, okay. let's just say. Yeah. Any, any other key differences that we should know about? And also, are there any circumstances where one would want to consider a private foundation later in their life rather than a donor advised fund? I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I'd say the people I've met that have private foundations are people, they're, they're a little bit of like the alpha male, alpha female. They like control. Okay. You know, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not part of, I, I don't like being part of any groups. I don't like being part of like the team or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a member of a club. I like to do my own thing. I also don't want somebody telling me what to invest my money in. I like to invest it and I want to have control. So that would be sort of what I would call the, uh, the psychology of somebody having a private foundation. But uh, look at, we have several private or donor advised funds. I have a couple personally, I have a couple for our corporation, you know, for our company, because we love to, to tithe our money, but also get our suppliers to tithe money if we're going to work with them, mm -hmm. in which case we ask them to give money to our foundation, our corporate mm -hmm. foundation. We can mm -hmm. then use that money for, you know, sponsoring, uh, like we have a, a ski day we sponsor every March, you know, up at Alpine, where we bring 70 of our clients. We can use that money in our donor advised fund, our corporate donor advised fund, because it's going to a charity and, and use that for good things. So I, I think once somebody opens up a fund, it's incredible. They go, why didn't I do this earlier? And then it's just, it just becomes something you get used to and you learn about and you start adding more to it. And you see there's so much good that you can do. And it's often just by converting taxes into charity, which is lovely. That's amazing, Mark. So last question I had was on this topic of the charitable gift annuity. Can you just talk to us about how this works and who may benefit from this? Yeah, again, it's not very big here in Canada. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, it's a huge, huge, huge business in the United States. Okay. Billions of dollars. So we're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, the you know, the the Yales, the Harvards, all those big endowment funds. And the way it works is this. Let's say you are an investor mm -hmm. and you're also charitable and you still need yield on your money. You still need to make money. Right. So it's not like you're ready to be that charitable, okay. but you'd like to do something. So imagine somebody has a hundred thousand dollars and they'd like to make an investment return on that, but they'd also like to do something for charity that saves them taxes today. So what they could do is they could be in touch with a charity or with us. We did this, what we do, and they could take that hundred thousand dollars. The charity would take a portion of that money, let's just say it was $60,000 as an example, and they would invest that $60,000 in an annuity. An annuity actually provides a guaranteed cash flow for life on the money that's invested. Uh, most of the money is you're receiving is principal back, so the tax treatment on it is very, very small versus what it, what, what it would be if you were just investing elsewhere. So really today, it would generate on that hundred thousand dollars probably about a six seven percent return guaranteed for life hmm. on that sixty thousand. Mm -hmm. The other forty thousand is considered a charitable donation. Mm -hmm. So you get a charitable receipt for that forty thousand dollars that basically saves you twenty thousand dollars of tax. Right. The annuity income continues to be paid for you for life. When you die, the annuity is gone. Right, mm -hmm. but you've made a nice donation of forty thousand dollars today that the charity will be very grateful for and likely recognize you for, and you know, in in a more substantial way than you giving you know a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars to that particular place. So it's really the intersection there of an annuity and tax and philanthropy that's creating not only the cash flow for the the donor but also a charitable receipt today to save taxes. So I, I guess my one question on this is, I, I see a few ways to go about it. Like somebody could go just all through charity or somebody could say, hey, I have $100,000. I want to give 40000 to charity and then I can keep 60000 for myself and go a fixed income route outside of charity. I guess why, 
wh- why not do it that way as opposed to just going all, all through the charity? Uh, does that make sense? Well, remember, um, if they're yeah. taking the $60,000, you're saying just investing it in, uh, let's say, a portfolio of stocks, right? Yeah. Or or, yeah. or, or something f- fixed income related. Like if they need some cash flow, I, I guess why not uh, Why not just right. kind of uh, go that remember, route? Remember, this, yeah. this would have to be uh, – um, uh, um, no, it's this is not a one size fits all. Obviously, yeah. each person's situation yeah. is very unique. This would likely be for sort of a more senior type person mm-hmm. who wants those guarantees. It's almost like getting a pension. You want something coming in all the time. You know that if you took that sixty thousand and invested it, there are risks. Let's say if you put it in the market, you can lose. You can have downturns. You can have you know. So this would not be all of somebody's money. This would be one piece of it, but it has to be looked upon in, in the in the more global context around making sure that people have done proper retirement planning, they've done proper estate planning, and they're doing proper philanthropic planning that brings those other two pieces together. I guess, Mark, my question more is, so I want to make sure I understand this. $100,000, let's say 40 of that is charitable, and the other 60000 uh, is invested. Gets an annuity. Gets an annuity, an annuity. right? Yep. But is that annuity, because I'm not too familiar on the topic of annuities, but is that through like a, a life insurance policy? Like how does that actually... It's through, an, through an insurance company. The way that yeah. the annuity works is people know what a mortgage is. Yeah. They're kind of, it's like with a mortgage, you go to a bank and say, here, I want to borrow a million dollars and now you pay them interest and principal return, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The difference with an annuity is you're taking an amount of money, giving it to an insurance company and saying, I want a guaranteed income from this money that I'm giving you. So it's it's like a mortgage, but where you're, you're the bank by giving the money, the, the principal, right? Okay. So what's nice about that is the cash flow is fully guaranteed. So there's no market risk and no interest rate risk. The only risk is that you're creating a budget for life for you because yeah. it'll never go up. It'll never go down. That means if you're getting it, let's just say it's 6% and interest rates go up to 10%, you're going to be, you don't want to kick yourself going, ah, if I only shoulda, coulda, woulda, I would have made 10. This is a budget for life, right? So, but it's not all your money. It would be just for a portion of your money for a cause that you're very passionate about because it's a way of you being able to give a lot more for, you know, a, a lot less cost. Okay. And then when you pass away, that portion that went towards the annuity, what, what happens then when you it's pass gone. away? Gone. And the, the charity doesn't get anything extra or? Gone. It's, 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 gone. it's all done. It's gone. Okay. gone. Now those annuities generally will have a, uh, a guarantee on them. Mm-hmm. Let's say, uh, you know, a 10 year, 15 year, 20, that'll reduce the annuity amount that you're getting. But it means that if, you know, somebody has, they put in that 60,000 and then they die the next day. Well, that's not fair. Insurance company got 60,000. You got very, you got nothing. So there's a commuted value where there would be continued payments to your family, mm-hmm. or you can have those commuted payments continue to the charity got right? It. or both. Okay. Like there's no... Yeah. I, I, we, yeah. We've created a, a, another structure that I think is more compelling. We call it the GPS, which is the, mm-hmm. the gift pension strategy. Mm-hmm. And that's also using an annuity and tax and philanthropy, but it adds a life insurance component as well. And I just want to tell you a high level. Let's say somebody has a million dollars of non-registered money and they're 65 years of age, a husband and wife. They could take that million dollars and create for themselves about a 10% pre-tax guaranteed return on that million dollars. So now they're getting $100,000 a year guaranteed for life and create a $1 million legacy gift that will go to charity when they die. So when you were asking me what happens when you die, that solves it. There's a, because there's a portion of that annuity money that's funding a million dollar life insurance Got policy. It. It. Because it's owned by a charity, you're getting a charitable receipt for those premiums and you're getting this amount of money. If people want, they don't need that, let's say $50,000 income every year they could give that to charity while they're alive and create more tax deductions or they could use that income of fifty thousand dollars believe it or not to create another insurance policy that would go back to their family so imagine giving a million dollars to charity and your family gets two million dollars so again there's no cookie cutter here (laughs) it's about people sitting down with a professional and having a discussion to see where do all of these things line up and what's going to be the most optimized for their family Mark, super interesting how you think about 
all these topics and really bring them together. So tax efficiency, philanthropy, insurance, it's, it's honestly, it's fascinating. I think we're just kind of at the tip of the iceberg, so many more deep dives to do. But Mark, I want to thank you for your time, making time for me again and educating our listeners. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I agree with you and I appreciate very much you making this uh this this podcast available. Hey, no, it's 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 a pleasure. I mean, I'm in the kind of it's all in the spirit of information sharing and when you have complicated subjects, you just need to talk to the right people, right? So um yeah, Mark, it's a pleasure always to chat and connect and collaborate. We've got keep- more subjects to cover together, so I look forward to it. Okay, keep all Mark. Bye. You too, all the best. So guys, thank you for continuing to join Beyond MD and helping the podcast to grow and reach other people. All relevant links are going to be in the show notes. And until next time, stay well, stay savvy.